Welcome to Sunday Morning at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and we are in the season of Advent. These are the four weeks that we will prepare for the coming of the Christ child that will culminate in our Christmas Eve celebrations, our 11 o'clock Sunday morning service, and then our combined 5.30 service with communion and candlelight. Come and join us. But the question for this time is, how will we prepare for God breaking into the world through the infant Jesus? Come, let's explore together. Come on in. The first reading will come from Luke 1, 45 through 55. And blessed is she who believed that there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And his holy name, his mercy, is for those who fear him. And generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John 1, 6 through 8, and 19 through 28. Listen for the word of the Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Then we jump to 19. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then he said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've all been to those weddings. It's all well-meaning that the bride and the groom have their niece or nephew as the ring bearer. And often chaos ensues. Goldfish are needed. A nap was missed. You never know what's going to happen. In this particular case, thankfully, it was just the rehearsal. But the five-year-old nephew of the groom was the ring bearer. And so he started running around, baring his teeth. He was growling. He was snarling. 
He was chasing the flower girls around, just being mean and out of control. Finally, his mom says, what are you doing? He says, mom, I'm doing my job. I'm the ring bearer, bearer, the ring bearer, bear. His role was a little misunderstood. Although he was doing what he thought was right, Today, we have a passage that is telling us what roles we are to play. Today's sermon is simply three words, joy, light, and witness. So let's start with joy. So it is the third Sunday of Advent. Why the pink one, preacher? Got three purples and a pink? This Sunday is set aside. Traditionally, there are a couple of things that claim tradition for this. This could be the shepherd's candle. This could be Mary's candle. Um, But what we normally see is that this is the Latin word godete, meaning rejoice. And it's focused on Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So we are now deep three out of four weeks in Advent. In the first couple of weeks, we are to prepare, and that continues today. But why is this joyful over the others? Because we know it's coming. Because we sense that Christ again will be celebrated and break into the world to change things for all time. So the pink is a color of joy and celebration And so today, we are looking ahead because we know Christ is coming. And we are to be joyful servants. Joyful. That doesn't mean always happy. That doesn't mean always shallow, pretending to smile. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you? The Sunday morning plaster. I like to smile. Smiling is my favorite. Joyful for us as Christians means we know we are connected to Jesus Christ, and that brings us joy, that no matter what we do, where we go in this life, we are not alone. God sent God's Spirit to stay with us, to walk with us, to heal us, to hold us, to comfort us, to challenge us. And there is joy in that. Do you get joy from a lot of Christians sometimes? Do we sometimes? Gotta go to church, the the preacher. We get some of that, sure. But I want to read a quote from Karl Barth, Swiss Reformed theologian. He talks about theologians, but I also say put in the word Christian. The theologian or Christian who labors without joy is not a theologian or a Christian at all. Boom! Sulky faces, morose thoughts, and boring ways are intolerable in this field. I love that. Love it. Means that as Christians, we know what we've been given. We know the joy inherent in the way that God loves us, each one of us in the way that joy should be at the core of who we are as Christians and seekers of Jesus Christ. Number two, light. As we look at the gospel according to John, we remember John doesn't begin with the birth story or the birth narrative. John begins going back to the beginning. John 1.1 says, in the beginning was the word. What does that make you think of? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. A few verses later, God says, let there be light. God spoke light into being and started to speak the rest of creation into being. And John is making this kind of cosmic connection that Christ, who is the word, was there in the beginning with God. So from the first day of creation, Christ was present as a part of God. 
And now Christ is starting to become flesh and blood and things are going to change. This interplay of light and darkness is really a lot of the core of what Advent is about. We light one more candle each week to prepare for the coming of Christ. That means we are becoming more illumined, illuminated. The darkness is being forced out as more light centered on Christ comes into the world. Our Jewish friends celebrate Hanukkah in kind of a similar way in the sense that as the eight days continue, more lights are lit for them to celebrate the rededication of the temple after it's, uh, uh, it was uh, taken over and defiled, and they only had enough oil in that re-consecration for one day, but it lasted eight, so they do eight candles. It too is light in the darkness. It is about Christ coming forward. It is about preparing the whole movement of Advent is getting more and more light as more and more joy, more and more excitement as we get closer to Christmas Eve. And this first prologue here in John is all about the light. His job was to witness to the light. He is not the light. Christ is the light. He's coming. John says again and again and again, it's not me. I'm not the light. Christ is the light. Look at him. Here he comes. And John encompasses both light and water in his baptisms. Marilyn Robinson wrote the book Gilead, which I know some of our theology and literature folks read. She, in that book, was always on the lookout for the glory that looks in the, lurks in the everyday. And she put this understanding of a sprinkler, a lawn sprinkler. She marries these two things together, light and water. Because you see, this commentator says, sprinklers expose water droplets to sunlight, and in that shimmering moment, you see each drop not as the stuff you use to do the dishes or mop the kitchen floor. No, you see that each drop is really a jewel, a mini cathedral, as the light refracts to expose the dazzling rainbow that surrounds us always. The essence of light and water is revealed in the moment, and it reminds us of the glory that engulfs us daily. Something sacred in the ordinary, light and water coming together in the person of John. I am not the light. I am preparing you. Why is he baptizing? He is baptizing to give them a way to purify themselves because he knows Christ is on the way. Christ is coming, so be ready Clear up the mess that you can. Otherwise, you won't be able to fully embrace him. He talks about this in the sense of us being cluttered and having to get rid of the spiritual debris that keeps us from welcoming Christ. I love this old story about the cynical couple at their breakfast table their neighbor's wa uh, uh, washing machine must be out. So their laundry is in the backyard and they can see it from their breakfast table. And the first day, the wife looks out the window and looks and says, they don't know how to do laundry. Their laundry is dirty even after they wash it. Somebody ought to go talk to them. Husband says, okay. Day two, the husband looks. And he says, you know what? You're right. Their laundry is a mess. How can you not know how to do laundry? Do we need to take them some detergent? Do we need to go over and tell them how to do it? So they walk out, and as they get out into their driveway, they look, and the laundry is beautiful and clean. What they realized was that it was their windows that were mucked up and covered in goo and grime so that the light could not accurately represent what they were looking at. And so much of our lives 
are in that vein. And that's what we are trying to do in Advent. And that's what John is trying to do with this baptism. Get that squeegee. Get that water and that light. And we seek to cleanse our souls and purify ourselves. You're never perfect. You're never there. But to beat back the sinful mess that can overtake us, because then we will be ready to welcome and fully celebrate the Christ child who is born into the world. So sometimes we start with a muck. And we have to clean that ourselves. If you remember the story in John 9, 6, that weird story when Jesus heals the blind man and he takes the mud and he spits in it and he makes that yummy paste right there in his hands and he puts it on his eyes and he tells him to go wash. In the same vein, he puts that cluttered goo mess, go wash, let the light come, let the water purify you, and then he could see. That is what Advent is all about. And when we take that seriously, then we can celebrate what happens next week when Christ is born. Finally, witness. John the Baptist in John's gospel, John the Baptist did not write John's gospel, different John. John isn't referred to as the Baptist. He baptizes, but his sole purpose is to be a witness, be the witness. That's it. That's his main role, is to point and say, get ready, he's coming. And all of us are called to do the same. We talked some about this last week. But as a part of how we clean up the muck a little bit and beat back some of that so that the light and the water and the joy can come through, we are called to be witnesses now for the good news that we have been given. And when I say that, I mean we share this somehow in the world. What if you had the power to cure cancer by going to a cancer patient in saying, you are healed. Would you do that? You're darn right you would. What would it be if you didn't? It would be a travesty. It would be awful, inhumane. You had the power to heal somebody and you didn't do that. This is bigger and more important, as amazing as that would be. We have the ability to share the good news, this light, this joy of Jesus Christ. Heal people through God in this life, in the next, in the way that God will do that through us. To give them hope and peace and joy and love. And when we don't do it, it becomes that we are poor stewards. We cannot hoard this. We are built and designed to share it in a variety of ways. And we are not those who go out and said, you better turn so you don't burn. We are those who witness by saying, come and see. Let me tell you about this, or this is what I understand. Nobody has it all figured out. You don't have to. You will never. None of us do. But you know enough to share Christ's grace and love with the world in a variety of ways. Maybe it is speaking directly to someone. Maybe it's offering a prayer or a hug or, you know, I don't have it all figured out, but this is what I believe and I want you to know. Come and see. Later on in John, 1 John 46, where the disciples are being called, Philip is called first and then goes to see his buddy Nathaniel and says, Jesus, he's here, the Messiah is here. Where's he from? He says, Nazareth. And Nathan is, is the one that says, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And then Philip, not Jesus, Philip says, come and see. He was witnessing already, even though he himself had just been called. 
So that is our charge as witnesses today, to be called into the world to tell others, to show others. It is by word, it is by deed, it is not by pressure, it is not by fear, it is come and see what I understand. I know enough to know that Christ rose for me and for you. I know enough to know that God loves you and you are special through the grace, think of our candles, the hope, peace, joy, and love that God gives to the world through Christ. And I want you to know that and experience. Come and see. That is our charge. And so my homework for you, your challenge this week, is to be a witness. Specific and concrete ways. I want you to do that this week somehow in a specific way. I know, we're Presbyterians. We've got it all going on up here. And that's pretty good. It's time to move that out. And that works together. Our head and our heart move us to be witnesses in the world. Come and see. And I want you to tell me the experiences you have. I will grade you accordingly. No, just kidding. The light and the joy are ours that we have been given in this third week of Advent. And we are called, like John the Baptist, to be witnesses, to take that light in joy, that good news, that grace into the world for tangible witness in a way that upholds, that shares the love, that shares the grace, that bids those to come and see. So with courage and with faith, let us take this light of Christ into the world this week. Hallelujah. Amen.